So now it's um, exactly one o'clock. I welcome everyone to this um, academic session. Uh, <clears throat> and I hereby open this academic ceremony um, in which Anita Razmain will defend the academic thesis entitled Working Out the Brain, Clinical Application of fMRI Neurofeedback and Ultra High Field Investigations of the Underlying Mechanism. And I kindly ask you now, Mrs. Razmain, to um, give us a short summary of your great work. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I hope you can see the presentation. Um, dear Prorector, members of the Corona, colleagues, friends, and family, thank you for being here today. In the following minutes, I would like to present to you the work gathered in my thesis entitled Working Out the Brain, Clinical Applications of fMRI Neurofeedback and Ultra High Field Investigations of the Underlying Mechanisms. So imagine that you as a student notice that your attention span is much worse than that of your colleagues. You, for example, get diagnosed with ADHD, attention deficit disorder, and the next step is try to figure out how could you improve your symptoms. So cognitive and behavioral deficits are closely associated with suboptimal functioning of a related brain area. We can therefore imagine that if we try to tackle, try to um, actively um, target a brain area that has been shown to be uh, suboptimally functioning and try to bring it to that of a healthier participant, we could also expect an improvement of clinical symptoms. One way to do this is for neurofeedback training. So neurofeedback essentially provides the participant uh, the information about the current brain activity in a, for example, a selected brain area. The participant can then use this information to improve strategies and further increase, for example, increase the activation in a selected area. The most common way to show neurofeedback information is through a thermometer display, as you see here on the screen. Here, essentially, the more the thermometer is filled in, the more activation was detected in the selected brain area. So you can imagine that for this, we of course have to measure brain activation. We can use various different types of neuroimaging techniques, but the one we will focus on today is called MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. MRI is a medical device commonly found in the hospital environment, and it can be used to investigate various different conditions from, for example, torn knee ligaments to brain aneurysms. But if we tweak the parameters in correct way, then we can also say something about the activation of the brain. That is called functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. And this is also what we used to provide neurofeedback to our participants. Now, fMRI does not directly inform us about the triggering of the neurons. Rather, it measures a very closely associated phenomenon, and that is the oxygenation levels of the blood flow, very simplistically. So the more oxygen that is detected in a certain brain area, the higher the signal we can measure. And this is also the information that we later use to provide neurofeedback to our participants. Now that we know what neurofeedback is and how it works, let's talk about the topics of my thesis. So we will cover three different chapters. And in chapter number two, we will look at clinical applications of fMRI neurofeedback. What is the current evidence, reporting quality, and effect sizes of the currently available studies? In chapter number three, we will look at metacognition, self-awareness, and its influence on fMRI neurofeedback performance. In chapter number four, we will focus on layer-specific information which means that we will try to determine the source of fMRI neurofeedback signal on the laminar level. And we will also see if new laminar neurofeedback studies are feasible. Now going deeper into chapter number two, we perform the systematic review of fMRI neurofeedback studies in clinical populations. We wanted to see what was the available evidence for different disorders and what was the quality of this evidence. And we investigated this by checking the quality of reporting with for methods and results. And we also wanted to see if the reported results are encouraging, meaning that they indeed report um, clinical benefits. So we see that in the currently available literature, um, a wide variety of different disorders has been covered. Anything from tinnitus, post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, anxiety and also ADHD, the example we started with. But what is also noticeable is that 
besides, for example, for depression, the majority of the, of the disorders I are covered only by maybe two or three studies. So this is not a lot, but in order to further see what is the available evidence, we dived deeper following CRIT NF checklist, which is a checklist that is commonly recommended to be used together with neurofeedback studies in order to ensure concrete and thorough reporting of the results. We obviously looked at various different parameters of the checklist, but today we will focus on two key measurements of success, and that is regulation success. So can participants gain control over the selected area, or for example, connectivity between two different areas? And do they show clinical improvements? And finally, is there a relationship between regulation success and clinical improvement? In terms of the results, we see that the majority of the studies indeed report successful regulation of the clinical group, meaning that clinical populations can gain control over the selected brain area. In the studies that included some sort of a measure of clinical or behavioral significance, we see that about two thirds, this does not necessarily mean that um, the improvement came as a result of neurofeedback training. In order to uh, check that, we looked at the third point, and that is the correlation analysis between regulation of success and behavioral outcomes. So in the studies that indeed included a correlation analysis, about two thirds of them, again, report a positive correlation. In practice, this means that the participants who could gain good control over the selected brain area and perform better than, for example, the rest of the um, participants also experienced stronger symptom improvement. Now, unfortunately, a vast majority, 72% of the studies did not include a correlation analysis, meaning that we can not make any concrete conclusions about the effect of regulation success on behavioral outcomes. So this brings us to the most important point, and that is that improved reporting is indeed essential to demonstrate that neurofeedback is needed for clinical improvement and to make more concrete conclusions about the effectiveness of fMRI neurofeedback for different clinical applications. Moving on to chapter number three, here we looked at performance self-evaluation. Specifically, we wanted to answer if participants are aware of what they're doing during neurofeedback training and if they know if they're performing well. So we decided to use one of the perhaps most widely, most popular uh, tasks in fMRI neurofeedback training, and that is motor imagery, specifically mental drawing. Mental drawing is a great task because it enables us um, easy manipulation of the difficulty of the task, meaning that, for example, we could ask participants to try and achieve 60% of what they think is the most effort they can put into mental drawing. So, for example, lightly sketching something or 90% where they would try to reach almost their maximum ability by, for example, um, imagining really harsh strokes or drawing with a lot of detail. So in the study itself, this is exactly what we did. We first asked the participants to try and regulate to either 60 or 90% of their maximum capacity. After that, we asked them to self-assess. Do they think they actually achieved, for example, 60%? Did they slightly over or underperform? And finally, they were asked to assess their confidence in the rating they provided before. Finally, they were provided with actual neurofeedback, meaning that they received information about the level they achieved based on the measure of brain activity. In terms of the results, all of the participants could successfully regulate. And in terms of the prediction of their performance, the results are as follows. Here, you see a graph representing the difference between their prediction and the level of activation they actually achieved. We see it plotted through three different sessions that they completed. And you see that the difference between prediction and actual level they achieved is decreasing, meaning that they actually became better at predicting their performance. On the other hand, in terms of confidence, their confidence did not improve or otherwise change throughout the three training sessions. So in conclusion, we see that participants can learn to self-regulate their brain activity to distinct levels of activation. And we also see that they do become better at predicting their actual performance through neurofeedback training. On the other hand, we see that they do not seem to become more confident even with improved regulation and prediction of their performance. Finally, 
In the final chapter, chapter number four, we looked at layer specific information. What does that mean? So we know that cortex can be separated into six distinct layers based on the cell types present in each of these layers. Now this we know from postmortem studies, but with fMRI uh, data, we can try and model these layers as seen here from blue to red. From a previous study done by a different group, um, we could predict that mental imagery, um, the same task that was also used in the previous uh, study that I mentioned, uh, will most likely activate more superficial rather than deep layers of SMA, supplementary motor area, which was our target region. Now, we were curious to see if we can include a second task that would um, provide differential activation. So for example, in deep layers, and we decided to include a second task called mental calculation. Here, participants add or subtract numbers. And as I said, we were kind of hoping that uh, we could see a different laminar profile of the activation. So in terms of the results, we see that both tasks indeed activated our target area, which was SMA. But there was a clear preference for different subregions of SMA for each of the two tasks. On the laminar level, we were indeed correct to assume that motor imagery would activate more superficial layers, but that was also the case for mental calculation. So in conclusion, we can say that laminar neurofeedback is in theory possible and that either of these tasks could be used to target superficial layers, but of different subregions of SMA. Since we could not find any clear laminar differentiation, we cannot use these two tasks to target the different layers of the same region SMA in our case. So now to try and summarize the findings that have just been presented, we see that some clinical evidence of neurofeedback implica impl applications are already available, but that larger clinical trials with more thorough reporting are indeed needed for each disorder in order to make more concrete conclusions about the effectiveness of neurofeedback training in clinical populations. In terms of training, we see that participants do become better at predicting their neurofeedback performance with training, but they do not seem to increase their confidence, which might have important implications, for example, for transfer runs or any other situations where neurofeedback information is not readily available. Finally, we see that motor imagery and mental calculation cannot be used to target different layers of SMA, but that laminar neurofeedback is in theory possible even with these two tasks. Now this opens a new avenue of potential applications and investigations within the fMRI neurofeedback field. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I would like to return the word back to ProRector. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, dear candidate, for this very uh, timely but also very clear presentation of your work. Thanks a lot. I would like to open the opposition now by asking Professor Miguel uh, Castello Branco, uh, who is Professor of Cognitive, no, no, I did it again, I'm sorry, Professor of Biostatistics, uh, uh, University of Coimbra, Portugal. Uh, Miguel, you have the word. Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this jury. I would like also to compliment Anita for her hard work and ambitious work in this thesis, as well as the supervisor as, and the, the colleagues. So I will go uh, quickly to the questions. So I enjoyed very much reading the thesis and uh, uh, I also liked the ambition. Uh, so it was it was really rewarding to read your thesis. Uh, I only have very two minor comments on, on, on the document. One is that I was looking for a paper of Reiner, a very seminal paper of Reiner on, uh, published in European Journal of Neuroscience on the relation between perception and imagery. And uh, I, I missed that citation. So it's a, paper, a very seminal paper on uh, providing a seminal understanding on the relation between perception and imagery networks. So that's a minor comment. The second minor comment is on, you mentioned PET as an hemodynamic technique and I would call it more a metabolic technique. So these are the two minor comments I would have on the, on the, on, on the writing. And now going to the questions, I I'm of course very interested in metacognition. 
And um, actually, there is now this discussion on between volitional and non-volitional neurofeedback. But going to the results of your thesis, you were uh, identifying brain regions involved in metacognition. And uh, you were talking about a, a lot about the role of the insula, but I missed in your results the anterior cingulate cortex. So that for me, it was a bit uh, uh, surprising. I'm, more, I'm now running projects on error monitoring, you know, these regions involved in the error negativity and the theta related er uh, error uh, signals. And so the, uh, actually we have some results where prior to the error, we see a lot of insular activity and post error, we see a lot of anterior cingulate. So do you have any, uh, I would expect that when people are engaged in neurofeedback, they would have strong activation of the error monitoring network, in particular the anterior cingulate, but somehow for some reason, it does not pop out. So can you comment on that? Yes, uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you so much for uh, kind words and for your question. Um, yeah, so specifically for, for metacognition, um, indeed there is um, a wide network that we were expecting to be activated, some of the regions we indeed encountered and some not. Um, I think looking back at the study, perhaps the design that we decided on in the end was also not the most ideal to really look into the processes of metacognition. So precisely looking at prediction and confidence because we left a very, very short interval um, between different parts of the trial, let's say. Um, so there might be some overlapping information also still residual from the neurofeedback training, but indeed also during neurofeedback training, you would imagine that um, some self um, monitoring processes are already running. Um, so this is an interesting observation. Now, why it was not activated? Oh, that is uh, difficult to say. It could be just, I don't know, based on the nature of the task that was used, although that is um, perhaps not the most uh, confident <laughs> reply I can give you. Okay, no, yeah, of course the question is open and there are many reasons why the way, so uh, this anterior cingulate and this, the insula belong to the saliency network. And depending on the task demands, sometimes you have more insular activation. In fact, I would expect more insular activation and that leaves, uh, leads me to the second question, which is related to the confidence. In fact, I'm not surprised that confidence levels didn't change because you are under conditions where there is high uncertainty and high ambiguity. So when you are in a task where people are trying to estimate uh, the, the levels they reach, there is high ambiguity and uncertainty. And so I would expect, uh, since ambiguity and uncertainty in, at least in my view, don't, don't change that much. I would expect that confidence would not change. And this very much reminds me of psychophysical experiments when, when you run staircases, where people many times are more confident in the worst regions of performance when the jumps in, the, uh, in contrast levels are high. So for me, that was not uh, a complete surprise. And then there is this issue, you talk a little bit about precision and accuracy. You have a paragraph on that in your thesis. So when, uh, and you talk, people may be confident about their accuracy or they may be confident about you, their precision. So my question is, could you improve the question or the strategy and really, or the question on confident and ask people, are you confident about your precision or are you confident about your accuracy? So maybe this could be an improvement, but I would like to, to know your thoughts about it. Yes, um, yeah, I, I indeed, uh, indeed agree that, especially due to the task. So I was thinking also, for example, in terms of clinical applications, this is not a task that participants usually encounter. So we really made it much more difficult for them trying to achieve two different uh, levels of activation which is difficult on its own um, because it's a mental strategy. There are other factors, the, the environment, um, the just tiredness of a participant. Um, 
And also, for example, just the uh, noise from, uh, yeah, a signal to noise ratio, for example, that uh, might influence this. So it's indeed a very difficult task. Um, and it is not to be expected the participants would all of a sudden be, for example, I don't know, 90% uh, sure that they indeed reached the, the, um, the level. Um, we were having a lot of conversation about whether we should ask about the confidence in their assessment or in the regulation. And that would indeed be two different uh, questions, two separate questions. Um, we decided to go for this because we were really curious about their self-assessment, self-awareness. So it made more sense to ask about the confidence of their self-assessment in terms of predicting what they will achieve rather than self-assessment in terms of, did I reach the level that I should um, reach? So this second question was kind of addressed already in the, in the rating, self-rating self itself. Um, right. Um, so, okay. yeah, <laughs> did I answer your question? I'm sorry, I got a bit. Uh... But uh, I think this may this discussion may, may, may be related to the to the reason why you didn't find parametric effects. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't want to, to to speculate too much about it. So I will go now to the to the systematic review uh, part of your thesis. Mm -hmm. That was very interesting. Uh, so we were involved in a consortium called Brain Train on, 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 on this topic using in clinical populations. So I was a bit surprised to see that. So there are some pre-register studies. There are a few clinical trials. But I was really surprised to see that you said, you stated that none of them really have a statistical analysis plan. Mm -hmm. that normally, you expect that in a formal clinical trial. So my comment to that is that it is not sufficient to register to really have a formal clinical trial. You really need a statistical analysis plan. So can you comment on that? I was really surprised to, to read that. I, I agree. Um, I was also assuming that that would be a part of the, let's say, registration package. Um, but indeed, mainly um, it was on a very high level. So for example, we will uh, include a experimental group and a control group, but not, and for example, compare them, but there was no real plan in terms of what exactly will be compared. Like for example, will they compare the first run to the last run or two sessions or so, depending obviously on the, on the exact um, um, design of the study. Um, so that was quite surprising, but indeed not even one registered trial that I found had that kind of information provided in advance. So from a top level, but not really the details of, of the analysis. Yeah, yeah, I remember that in the, our brain train consortium, we were all asked to have a statistical analysis plan that was validated by, by the clinical trial uh, unit. So, and now going also to that paper, you talk a little bit about blinding issues that most of the studies actually didn't check whether blind and blinding was maintained or not. Mm -hmm. So uh, in general, when we, when we do these systematic revisions, there is a section called bias analysis. So I had the impression that was not completely explicit in your ch chapter, except for the blinding. So can you make a general comment on what is your impression of bias in the studies that you have reviewed? And, and given the time, a, a, a very short answer would be very appreciated. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, oh, <laughs> now I have to think about it. I don't have time for it. <laughs> um, yeah, so indeed blinding was one thing that, was, that stood out um, clearly. Um, in terms of other things, uh, oof. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, oh boy. Um, yeah. So uh... maybe we can stop here. <laughs> I can just give a hint, like the sampling strategy of the clinic po populations, and if there is time in the end, we discuss. Okay. <laughs> it's not. It's not critical. I was, I was trying to special. make the the answer really short, and in that I completely blocked out. Yeah, maybe, maybe if yeah. there is time, we discuss it in the end. Yeah. Yeah, I apologize also. I know how this is when you uh, comment and then you uh, stop the thing and the train of thoughts, right? So thanks, uh, Professor Castello Branco. I pass the word on now to Professor.
Frank Scharnowski, um, Professor of Methods uh, of Psychology from the University of Vienna. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. The word is yours. Thanks, Elitz. I also want to start with congratulating you. It's a very timely and innovative thesis. And I think it's quite remarkable that you basically work on three different approaches to, to advance this field, right? You aggregated information to provide an overview of the current state of the field. You worked on understanding better and more the psychological processes associated with learning self-regulation. And you also pushed the technological frontier with laminar feedback. So this is, uh, this is I think, quite something. It's a nice package, sort of. Um, so I would start with the, with the chapter two. Um, when you looked into the, the correlation between regulation success and clinical improvement. Um, and it's, it's quite surprising that only few looked into the association and those who did, not all of them found this link. Um, so I'm wondering, first of all, why is it this association of brain changes and clinical effects so relevant? Why is it so important? Um, and why does not everyone report them? Are there other means that neurofeedback could work instead of changing brain activity? Um, or, or what would you say? Yeah, hi, Lisa Mubona. Thank you so much for, uh, for your compliments uh, and for a great question. Um, so indeed, it was relatively surprising to see that um, the correlation analysis between these two measurements uh, is uh, missing. Um, it's also true that, so for, for example, correlation analysis is obviously only one way to check if there is an association between the two. So um, it also does not necessarily implicit causality. And so, so there are definitely other approaches. Um, and it could also be that in the studies that did not report a significant correlation, um, I mean, this could be due to a variety of different reasons, including maybe a small sample size um, or yeah, just noisy data, let's say. Um, I think it's very important though to include, yeah, maybe even a, a complementary analysis that would kind of look into the same thing if there is an association between the two. Um, because essentially the question here is, do we need neurofeedback to achieve these kind of uh, uh, clinical changes? Um, so, and also to, to relate that, yeah, neurofeedback is the one driving this change. So that's why we would assume that, as I said in the example during the presentation, if if uh, we have participants who reach, let's say, the highest level of activation compared to the rest of the, the group, then if neurofeedback has a direct implication in the improvement of clinical uh, uh, symptoms, then we would also expect these participants to experience that change. Um, so the reasoning lies mainly in that, that, um, you know, maybe it's not in the same direction of, of analysis, but just comparing, for example, also a control group, which does not receive neurofeedback kind of is looking into the same direction of really proving that you indeed need the training part and receiving information um, to drive this uh, clinical improvement. Mm. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it could be placebo, it could be non-specific effects. So control groups is a good keyword. There, it I think, it well could be also sense. just strategies, right? I mean, mm -hmm. similar to cognitive behavioral therapy, we can do this outside of the scanner. So to prove that you indeed need the whole um, setup um, the scanner and all of this, then this is obviously mm. needed. Yeah. Mm, yeah, very good. Um, and in this chapter, you also work with the, the CREP checklist. Um, now, I think all that we are here are strong advocates of systematic reporting, and all that we are sitting here, we strongly believe in feedback. So, I want to take the occasion of from your experience using the checklist. Is there something missing? Is there, are there shortcomings? Should we extend the checklist, for example, to include information that might be relevant for approaches that you took that benefit the field? Oh, that's a good, that comes to your mind. That's a good question. I have to say that I was asked before uh, this presentation by some of the colleagues if, if I would recommend the checklist. And I said that it's, it's great because it's relatively short, but I feel like it captures the most important aspects of what should be in, let's say, a paper. So not every paper will obviously fall into these categories. I mean, my two chapters, the empirical ones, are a good example of this because I did not employ any control groups, for example. So it's nice to have also a little bit of flexibility there. Um, one thing, I mean, because we're trying to see, for example, also if we have responders and non-responders, for example, and I know there has been um, a, a meta-analysis done, I think also within your group, looking if, for example, the initial performance during, let's say, a localizer, or maybe if we go from a different perspective, also the initial uh, symptoms or something 
uh, could indicate if a person would be performing or not performing and indeed um, um, improve their symptoms, also be able to regulate and so. So maybe that's one thing that um, could be a potential addition to see if there is some sort of a correlation between, let's say, the initial state and the final outcomes, rather than looking just at the improvement um, part. That would be maybe the first thing that would pop into my mind. It's interesting. It's a good point. Yeah. Um, so at this time, I would switch to, the, I think, chapter three. Um, and basically, one of the general problems in your feedback is to make good use of information about mental strategies, a latent variable. And at the core of the problem is basically to quantify a latent variable, bring it to numbers so that we can make good use of that information. Now you use two ways, you basically focus on metacognition, which provides you a sort of quantitative grip on these mental strategy on these latent variables. And you also, I think you, for example, counted the number of strategy changes, which is another interesting way of getting numbers to that topic. Um, are there, and sorry, sorry, it's, a, it's a big question, but do you have any other ideas of making good use of that information, quantifying it so that it's tangible for our standard statistical approaches or any, any other pointers using that information, being it even qualitative psychology or other sources, text parsing? That's a, that's a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think... Oh, so to first address uh, the first point that you made, so for example, for uh, the fact that we counted uh, the, the changes that participants, uh, changes that they performed, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I think strategy one, changes. Yeah, one thing yeah. that um, already became clear when we were collecting these, um, uh, these reports is that it's a very subjective Thing of what participants consider a mental strategy change, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it could be, for example, for me, from the top of my head, if somebody said change your strategy, it would be, you know, instead of imagining to draw really, like really pushing the uh, pencil down, let's say, to try and draw with more details, right? Um, but we also, for example, noticed that for a lot of the participants, that just meant that they try to, you know, do the task a bit less, which is not necessarily a strategy change, is more of a, um, well, just the difficulty change, the level that they try to achieve. So I think before we even consider um, other potential ways of quantifying, we have to really well establish what we mean um, by the parameters that we use for the, the quantification. Um, yeah, and uh, given... Uh... <laughs> For the sake of time, I, I apologize that I again have to interrupt, but uh, time flies uh, and we have a lot of more colleagues. So thank, thank you very much, Professor Szanowski. Thank you. Uh, and I pass on the word now to uh, Dr. Florian Krause, is a researcher of the Radboud University Medical Center, but also recently from Maastricht University Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Krause, you have the word now. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Anita, I, of course, also first would like to congratulate you uh, for your thesis. Um, I thought it was a very diverse thesis covering very different uh, and important aspects that are or will become relevant for uh, clinical applications of neurofeedback. And of course, the, the current uh, problems associated with that. Uh, and yet, at the same time, you managed to uh, kind of wrap all this diversity into one very uh, coherent story. Uh, and, and I really enjoyed reading it. Um, I especially found chapter three very interesting, uh, where you show that uh, participants get better over time in predicting their performance, but not uh, in the confidence of those predictions. Uh, and like you, and maybe unlike uh, Miguel, I was uh, a bit puzzled about why participants would not get uh, more confident in their predictions over sessions, because I do think it's something you could expect. Um, now, you partially uh, explained this with the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, but I was wondering if there might be an even simpler explanation, actually. So even though you statistically and on average uh, um, show that participants could regulate to the two levels, um, your data also shows that they are in the very first session about three points off, right? And that's, uh, that's very much the, the, the distance between the two levels. Um, so at that point, I would argue that they cannot really uh, reliably predict which level uh, they regulate to. Now, they do become better, of course, uh, with their predictions over time. But in the last, the third session, there are still two points off, which is still quite a lot, I think. So 
Could it just be that uh, that this improvement was just too small for them to actually realize? Uh, and, and that's why they, they rated everything with the same confidence. Uh, and in, in relation to this, I'm, I'm wondering whether you, you might have any data such as uh, postdoc questionnaires or if participants mentioned anything in the debriefing uh, on, on whether they actually recognized uh, their improvement over sessions. Uh, yes, Tim Dupona, thank you so much for your compliments and uh, for this very interesting question. So, yes, indeed, um, that explanation could hold as well. Um, we did not collect any extra information beyond um, the confidence um, overall. So we did ask them at the end to um, provide them with their, let's say, most common strategies for each of the levels, but we did not further investigate into the um, uh, confidence levels beyond just asking them if there was something more they would like to um, share. Um, one thing that I um, would also mention is that how to further investigate this, and this is more from um, maybe more anecdotal, but um, we did notice that there was a stark difference between participants before they started with the neurofeedback training. So we did have a session with FNIRS before. Unfortunately, the, the data collection didn't really uh, uh, work as intended. So we did not use that information, but we did notice how um, there was this really big difference with, between participants being either very confident or not confident at all. And then indeed it kind of converged to this um, middle um, around 75% um, between 50 and 100 what, what we were collecting. Um, so it could be that indeed it was just their regulation was just too diverse to heterogeneous at this point for them to make any concrete conclusions. And that goes again to the previous answer that I also said with uh, just the difficulty of the task itself. Um, so the question is also if we, for example, um, provided, let's say, an additional training session, and if this would improve, that might answer this question then. Is it really just the level of, uh, of um, uh, accuracy of uh, the performance? And actually now thinking about it, um, so it was an insignificant difference, obviously, but the confidence ratings were just slightly higher during the second session, which was on average in terms of regulation, also the best one in terms of reaching level six and uh, nine. So it could very well be that it is indeed related just to their um, performance accuracy in terms of regulation. Okay. And uh, you mentioned the, the general difficulty of the task. Uh, and in relation to this, um, I was wondering in how far your, your choice of the specific target levels uh, might have actually made the task even, even more difficult. So you chose 60% uh, and 90% and as the two levels. And in particular, I was wondering uh, why you would choose two targets in the upper half of the max PSC range, uh, rather than having them more spread out uh, equally or, or at least use the full range between zero and, uh, and max PSC. Um, and I'm asking this because in, in one of our previous studies uh, where we used three target levels, uh, 30, 70, and 100, if I remember correctly, uh, what, we did saw, uh, what we did see there was that participants had especially a hard time to differentiate between the, the upper two, so 70 and 100 in our, in our case. Uh, so, so I was wondering what, what your thoughts are on this. Would you, uh, in a follow-up study, uh, um, kind of rethink your choice of, of these levels, or are there other good reasons why you would stick to them? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so we stick to uh, 60 and 90% for <laughs> essentially, I'm, I'm going to say historical reasons, because we had other previous studies doing 30, 60 and 90%. And indeed, our pilot study included three uh, levels. And in the end, we decided to um, remove um, the level 30% because it seemed the most difficult for the participants to stay, let's say, so low with the activation levels. Um, and as a result, we also wanted to boost the number of trials so that we could uh, increase the statistical accuracy. So 60 and 90 were indeed just kind of a, a consequence of the original design. And thinking about it today, perhaps going for 50 and 100% would indeed uh, make more sense because it's also more intuitive to try and um, reach, let's say, half of the maximum effort. So I agree with, with you in that, that uh, for future studies, maybe rethinking the percentages that we're trying to uh, achieve is indeed a, a good idea. Okay, thanks very much, um, um, Dr. 
Florian Krause for your um, nice questions. I pass on the word now to Professor Anne Rufs, expert in psychology and neuroscience of abnormal eating. Anne. Uh, dear candidate, uh, congratulations on your uh, PhD thesis. It was a pleasure to read. And I would also like to congratulate your supervisory team with this achievement. And as you may suspect, knowing that my background is a bit different, uh, my question may be slightly further from home uh, for you. First, the sentence of the prologue of your thesis really caught my attention. You introduce antidepressant medication as the most common treatment option, and then write, other currently available options for depression treatment include alternative and complementary approaches, such as exercising, meditation, acupuncture, and different types of therapy. And then you write that only cognitive behavioral therapy reached comparable results to antidepressants. Later on, you write, most patient population studies aim to maximize task-related brain activity changes towards minimizing the observed deficit and therefore bringing the region's functioning closer to that of a healthy population. This should in turn also reduce or completely eliminate the associated clinical symptoms. This way of writing suggests to me that to you, biology comes first when investigating and treating mental disorders and that you adhere to the so-called medical model of mental disorders. That is, the goal should be to search for an underlying, likely biological, in your case, neural, cause for mental disorders and then target that cause. However, mental disorders are highly heterogeneous. For example, someone can be diagnosed with depressive disorder if they meet five of nine diagnostic criteria, leaving a lot of room for interpatient variability. Also, the search for an underlying biological cause has been quite disappointing if you look in the literature. And there seems to be a bit of a move away from monocausal explanations of mental disorders. A first question to you is, what do you think? Is it still a viable path to try to discover a biological common cause for a mental disorder? If I may have instilled some doubts in you now, how would it affect the potential for newer feedback, you think? Yes, highly esteemed opponent, thank you so much for your compliments and this very interesting question. I, uh, I will have to agree with you. I don't think it's a purely biological phenomenon. I think there are a lot of uh, factors contributing to different um, uh, disorders. Um, and I think this also highlights really the importance of also, for example, stratification. So not every patients, so not every, um, not every patient experiences the same symptoms and they are not necessarily caused by the same either mechanisms or reasons, uh, environmental, um, biological, different components are obviously included. And this might also highlight or shed some light into the different treatment responses. So um, indeed, I mentioned antidepressants, for example, for depression to be the most widely used, kind of the golden st standard of depression treatment. But what is also important to notice is that um, in the first, so in the first run of uh, being treated for depression with antidepressants, only about 30% of the patients actually show a positive response to that. Um, and I think this is the, the first proof that if it was just purely biological and if there was just one reason for it, then we would target it and, you know, mm -hmm. people will be treated. Yeah. Um, if, so, I, if I may interrupt yeah. you, it could also be we just didn't find the cause. Do you, do you think it's likely if we continue on that we can actually someday find this common cause? I mean, I cannot say no, but I will say that it's very unlikely or it would be very, um, let's say, superficial, like from mm -hmm. the top kind of, okay, this is it. But then it, it's still, there are still other components that are patient specific and symptom specific. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is also something that is to go back to your question for neurofeedback. This is an important mm -hmm. piece of information. So who are the participants that would respond the best because it depends a little bit on the strategy that we use maybe it depends on the um, brain region that we target mm -hmm. um, so there are different components because we see that also in training that we obviously see some really nice results in certain participants the same thing is with for example um, cognitive behavioral therapy and antidepressants so 
in terms of uh, what to do, essentially try to figure out more specifically what differentiates different patients rather than putting them all into the same basket. Mm -hmm. Um, and then try to maybe selectively target them with different treatments if we can find mm -hmm. which patient would respond better, mm -hmm. or maybe even combine treatments. That would be mm -hmm. how I see yeah. the future, let's say. Yeah. Um, thank you for your response. And I have a follow-up uh, question. Um, and yeah, you, you, you admitted to this large heterogeneity. And uh, I asked you a bit, can we ever reduce a mental disorder to one common biological cause? And um, may maybe not, we, we agree on that. Um, if you then look at all the, the symptoms, for example, associated with um, depressive disorder, do you think it might be the case that certain symptoms are more likely to ever be described at the biological level than others? Which ones would you have in mind? And would these then also be more amenable to neurofeedback? Hmm, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, yes, <laughs> to a certain extent, I think, yes, yeah, certain symptoms could be perhaps better um, related to biological uh, uh, different measures from hormones to neurotransmitters. So those are then things that are also easier to target directly. Mm -hmm. um, Although there might be some, and then there might be others that can be explained both by perhaps biological reasons, but also maybe environmental reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm thinking, for example, in terms of the depression, for example, prolonged stress is something that could mm -hmm. affect. Um, and then it's, it would be interesting to look uh, into how this is also combining with the biological processes that are happening in the background, which is again related to, um, yeah, also changes in neurotransmitters, hormones, and so on. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe also what is, from this point of view, what is the, tar the, the trigger? So is it really the environmental aspect or was it first, let's say, the some sort of disbalance in, in the biological mm -hmm. um, uh, factors? So maybe that would be a good um, step to first uh, yeah and yeah. uh, maybe maybe if you uh, um so, sorry it's done uh, no it's fine know. it's fine yeah thank you <laughs> very a, much for your uh, answers it's an interesting discussion in general thanks a lot uh, but we have to move on and i give the word now to dr bettina Zer Zorga, associate professor of maastricht university bettina yeah, Anita, first of all, also, I would like to congratulate you and your supervisors for this great achievement. I'm also very proud because uh, we worked once together and I see you have developed to a, a major scientist, actually. So um, coming to my questions, um, I, I had several questions for the third um, chapter and partially they overlap with the previous um, statements from, from the other committee members. So I also would like to point to the lack of finding in increases in confidence. And I have kind of an intermediate um, position because I think it is possible to find increase of confidence, but there might be an, an, an adaptation necessary in methods. And I would like to, to have your opinion about that because I think the single trial reliability of hemodynamic um, methods is good, but is it good enough in a neurofeedback setting. So is the, the noise component that we find in single trials, maybe the reason that the confidence is not increasing, increasing across um, the sessions? What is your opinion about that? And what could we do methods wise to maybe then boost the confidence levels across sessions? Yes, esteemed opponent, thank you so much for your uh, compliments and your question. Um, one thing that, um, again, so I agree, there could be ways to um, further improve the methods section and to, <clears throat> pardon me, and to um, perhaps tackle the, these differences in confidence in that way. Um, indeed, one single trial is relatively noisy. Um, although we did use seven Tesla scanner to kind of try and improve, for example, the signal to noise ratio. One thing that we also noticed, and this is, again, we can say anecdotal, but it was very clear that there was also, for example, uh, preparation, motor preparation already before. So based on how we calculated the neurofeedback signal, we always compare the activity 
to the baseline right before. And if they started already improving, then the neurofeedback they received was lower than what they were actually, let's say, achieving in terms of the overall signal during um, that task. Um, so one of the perhaps simpler ways to, um, to tackle this variability in terms of the neurofeedback they received specifically in our session, in our um, study, would be just to find a way to prevent them to start preparing the, the, um, for the task. Let's say maybe vary the baseline um, or maybe, for example, in, in chapter number four, we did not observe this because we had two different tasks. So they didn't know which one to really prepare for. That would be one option. The other option would be just to average, let's say a couple of trials and then ask them. So this is kind of in the direction that uh, you were trying to uh, point me into. Um, I think that is also perhaps a, a good idea. I mean, um, in terms of the uh, um, uh, confidence, because it would also be in line a little bit with the results that we found with the, um, with the uh, prediction of the performance. So we had two results. I presented today just um, the overall performance, so their prediction versus um, the actual achieved level. But we also looked at if their um, prediction could be based on the previous five trials. So to kind of use that as the information rather than their current, um, um, their current performance, moment to moment performance. And it did show that they do use this previous information, which could then also um, help us with this confidence estimation over let's say a couple of trials because participants do seem to take that information into account and uh, combine it. Yeah, thanks for the good question, uh, the good answer actually. So, and staying with um, this chapter and with the self estimation of um, neurofeedback success, I was wondering I mean, just to have your opinion about it, why is it so necessary to have a good estimation of your performance? Because you have the neurofeedback signal in neurofeedback experiments. So, even if someone could not predict so well how well he or she pre uh, performed, could still learn a lot. So what was your initial idea also behind that? Are there even some things that you thought of for the future of uh, something what happens after neurofeedback training? Yes, Andy, this relates to mainly clinical populations. So obviously we performed our study in healthy participants. Um, but if, if we imagine, let's say, the future where neurofeedback is a clinical tool, then um, we cannot provide neurofeedback training for sessions, weeks, months. Um, we would perhaps have, let's say, one, two sessions that are needed uh, for the participants to um, learn how to uh, control, let's say, a selected brain area, learn how to use these strategies. And then we would hope that once they leave the, the fMRI, so the, the scanner, um, and they're in their natural environment, that they would also use these strategies to kind of try and further um, tackle their symptoms. Um, and if they can only do this successfully if they are aware of their performance. I mean, this is the, the shortest I can, I can say it, but essentially if, if they have an idea that what they're performing is having a positive effect also on their brain activity, that they're performing it well, that they're indeed targeting the, the, the area, that would be something that would help and also make them stick to the, to the treatment. Okay, so that means yeah, basically- no, uh, Yes, sorry, uh, I, uh... Um, uh, I think we have to just stop here because otherwise uh, Dr. Mario Zenten wouldn't have a chance to um, ask his questions. Um, I'm sorry, thank you very much, Dr. Zorga. Uh, and yes, Mario, the um, territory yes. is yours. Thank you very much. Well, dear Anita, I also have to agree with uh, the other committee members that you have compiled a very nice and interesting thesis. And I also enjoyed very much the presentation you gave today. That was also very clear and informative. That was really nice to see. So I would like to congratulate you and your supervisory team on this great work that you have uh, done over the past years. So my questions are mainly about chapter four. And mainly you said that chapter four is a pilot. And I was very curious to hear your idea about how this should be followed up. So what would be the next steps? Would you further pursue um, an F investigation of the laminar profile mechanisms or would you take what you have learned 
uh, and, and translate it now into an application? And, and what exactly would you do? Yeah, um, esteemed opponent, thank you so much for your compliments and your question. Um, so indeed, this was a pilot study. We tried to see if, uh, first of all, laminar and your feedback would even be possible. Um, and this, we tried to first investigate what laminar profile we would have to target. Um, so the idea for the, the first next uh, uh, study, not necessarily the following studies afterwards, would indeed be to try and um, do it in real time. So what we did now, we performed the neurofeedback studies, but we used the whole, um, the whole uh, region without specific, specifically providing information from a certain laminate, right? Um, so the next really nice, interesting step would be to now use really either of the two tasks and try to provide neurofeedback really just from that uh, layer. I think that would be quite interesting and also to prove our point that indeed it is uh, possible to do. Okay, and um, I have two follow-up questions to that. Mm -hmm. So one would be um, whether you would then also pursue maybe looking into other tasks or other areas where you might actually see different profiles in terms of the laminae. And the other is now that you said that you would like to stay in this area and go into real time and provide feedback specifically from uh, the superficial layers. Um, in terms of then thinking, to translate this into applications, what is the advantage of looking now specifically into this layer to provide feedback instead of as you do now to just get the, the whole area? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So that's why I said also before that that would be my first step to kind of see if we can provide uh, uh, feedback just from one layer. Um, but then if so, our initial idea was to get two different tasks that would activate two different uh, laminar profiles so that we could provide differential information, basically very specifically targeting just one network. Now, these two tasks were really fantastic for this because one is a motor task, clearly involving the motor network, motor preparation, and the other one is a more highly cognitive tasks, including yeah, mental calculation and not including any motor component. Um, so in order to kind of follow up on this initial idea, it would indeed be good to also look into other um, regions and try to find a different combination of two tasks where we could uh, try and show if we can differentially provide information. Um, but in terms of uh, SMA, um, here it would really be just to, to show that it's, it's possible provide, to provide the information just um, uh, from one laminate and also to see, I mean, because this is this would be done for the first time, so this is highly speculative, but um, we would assume because of the connections that uh, run from the superficial layers that we would be able to target a very specific part of the network um, from each of the tasks, right? So um, those are the kind of two directions that are not mutually exclusive in the future, yeah. Thank you very much. So if I understand it correctly, one advantage of using the layers is that you can have an idea about, let's say, feed forward and feed back, and therefore make some inferences about the type of network that you're targeting. So one question I would have there is, to what extent is this advantageous over using, let's say, um, two areas and the connectivity measure between them? So to drive the connectivity between two areas, that you measure, let's say, with functional connectivity as opposed to infer the network structure from the laminar profile? That's a great question. Um, well, um, so <laughs> the, the difference would be that um, between the connectivity, it, it's um, how to say this uh, in a nice way. Um, so in, in connectivity, we essentially have the information from the two regions and kind of the, we look at the difference, let's say between them, whereas with here, we would target just one region and kind of try to influence also the region in the net. Yeah, that was perfect timing, even with the audio delay. I think the time has passed now. Anita, is mine. 
the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed, the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. And I kindly ask you to await our return here. And I thank you all very much for this um, very good session. Thanks a, thanks a lot. We, we are back.
Correct, you are still muted. I'm sorry? Uh, could you start over? Your microphone was still muted. Oh, that's interesting. Was it an automatic mute? Sorry. Um, okay, I start over, of course, no problem. Uh, Anita Razmain, the Greek committee here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taken into account your previous qualifications, the, the Greek committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Goebel is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with the Dutch university custom. And I invite your supervisor now to take the floor. Rainer. Thank you, Porekta. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you, Anita Rasmain, the decree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive the decree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisor affixed with the official seal of the university shown by the beetle. Congratulations, Dr. Rasmine. I'm very happy to be the first who can call you like that. Half a year ago, I would have said, Dr. Tursic, so times change, right? Yeah. What a great defense. Um, I want to congratulate you uh, because um, your presentation was um, uh, yeah, identified by all the committee members as, as super clear and, 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 and very well done. And I also haven't seen that before. And I said, I couldn't do that uh, in, in this short time so clearly. So my, my compliments, uh, Anita. And um, yeah, I want to also congratulate your family and your husband, Manuel. They can today be very proud of you because of this wonderful achievement you have, have done. And of course, also congrats from your co-promoter, Judith. She will address you personally in a moment. I also want to take the opportunity to thank all Corona members for virtually coming to Maastricht to the defense and for, for the excellent and very challenging questions, which Anita, you mastered very well. It is habit to look a bit back how uh, the, the path we took together began. And I remember um, uh, when I screened to um, my emails and, and other documents um, that, um, um, yeah, I, I, you were of course one of our uh, uh, top research master students. And I remember meeting you in 13, 14 in the, in the, in the course of the research master. And um, uh, I realized that you were very early on um, becoming kind of a fan of uh, fMRI neurofeedback and BCIs. You loved that topic. And um, it is no, 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 no wonder then that you wanted to do also a master in that. And uh, um, you did this very well with Bettina. And um, um, Bettina taught you a lot, um, which is important for the next steps because I wanted to, to keep you and Bettina and me here in Maastricht, but let's, let's do one step after the other. So first, when I read your thesis at the time, I was the second supervisor, uh, I was quite impressed about the level of detail, the clarity, the, 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 the uh, very well written English and everything was just like a paper. So I was really impressed um, and, um, Understood then Bettina, who came to me a few times, oh, this is a very good student, we should try to keep her, right? So it was clear that Bettina was a fan of you, but I also became one when I read your thesis and learned to know you a bit better. And um, then, of course, um, towards the end of your uh, um, uh, master time, uh, you applied for positions because we didn't approach you and then what should, should you do? But we know about it because Bettina and I um, of course, um, um, wrote reference letters for your job. And I remember very well that I had a very difficult time at, that, uh, at this phase because I wrote once to a good friend of mine in Amsterdam where you applied um, uh, and, and, and wrote really nicely how talented you are and so on. 
And at the same time, I said, I don't want to let her go, right? But I don't have an opportunity. So it was very challenging for me and, and Bettina to, to basically um, approach you in the right way. So without promising too much, but also, you know, uh, because you had almost a sure opportunity already. And But I wrote that I have some grants running. I was honest. I don't know whether I get them. But if I get one of them, you will be the first to get the next open PhD position in the context of neurofeedback. So and that was um, fortunately at some point working. It took actually a bit of time. And in the meantime, you work uh, as a student assistant with Bettina and uh, later also with Bea, which for me was very good because you came better and better prepared. But on the other hand, I felt a bit sorry that you had a bit of a wait time. But I also uh, um, um, yeah, was happy that you decided for, for, for not going away and staying. And I'm very grateful that you did because that was uh, the way how we, we, we got you, so to say, as a PhD student. Um, and um, which started then in the summer of 2017. I checked just uh, the, the emails. And um, of course, this was not at the end directly. It was in, in, in brain innovation in the company uh, with the opportunity, of course, to do a PhD project uh, at the end. Um, but of course, it means it's a double duty. You know that I give quite some time for the PhD, uh, but I also and, and, and the uh, company demands some extra additional work, like support, which you did very well for our software, uh, but also, um, you know, some other projects I will come to, like the certification process and, and other things. But you won um, the hearts of the brain innovation colleagues by storm with your warm and, and open-minded personality. You know, I hear this from everyone. And um, um, they say when you were there, um, you know, everyone was smiling, giggling, and it was always fun. So, so therefore, you, you helped a lot to, 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 to en enhance the, the Wir-Gefühl, as I would say it, um, by your, by your uh, personality, which is just great. And when I contemplated about where this might come from, I learned from, from Judith Eck, I should say, because there are two Judiths involved, um, uh, that, that you were extremely close to your mom, or you are extremely close to your mom, and that it, it is what she believes is where you got your strengths and your kind personality. And I'm sure that your mom today is very proud of you giving your, your great achievements. And to cherish a bit the good times uh, we had uh, together, I looked at some pictures which Michael sent me and they evoked lots of nice pre-COVID memories. For example, from, from a CN day where we had this falconer there and you hold the big birds in your hand, from the Artifin where you were at the booth with Claudia and, and me in a very beautiful picture, uh, you know, and then um, uh, other pictures of several uh, human brain mapping conferences where you supported, of course, uh, Claudia, Armin, Michael, Judith and others at the brain innovation booth. And, and, and everyone, also people who come and you, you met in these meetings, um, uh, everyone um, uh, loved your humor and your cheerful laughter, which we also heard a little bit today. <laughs> And um, um, yeah, and the projects we, we decided to, to pursue in your PhD together were, were all very challenging. And this we have also heard today. They were quite diverse, but I think um, uh, you mastered them very well and you integrated them also very well. And especially in the project with uh, Santiago and Axel Clermans in Brussels, you, you really um, showed uh, very strong talents in, as a team player. You bring, brought these, you clued these projects together and, and really pushed it forward. Uh, the same with the team we made. You formed a wonderful team with, uh, um, um, especially Judith, Eck, uh, and um, um, Michael. So that was really, uh, for me, great to see. And I must be honest, I think without your um, uh, push and, 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 and contributions to that, I'm not sure whether we would have managed at the end because I was, like usual, very optimistic. Ah, this little bit of documents is easy. And I think the first was Claudia who warned us all uh, with her clear mind, this is a huge amount of work, right? And, and, and I underestimated that, but at the end we did it. And I'm very grateful that you also helped and contributed substantially to, to this achievement. I'm also happy that it had one very good side effect because the, the necessary literature research for the clinical FMI neurofeedback effects um, um, uh, led actually to the idea to extend that to a full-fledged review, which uh, we have just heard today about. And I think that was really a nice uh, uh, yeah, joint forces from the company work and your thesis work. Um, and this was also a nice collaboration with David Linton, of course, because it was all done for clinical purposes. And of course, the seven Tesla lamina study, I felt always a bit sorry because we had COVID 
at that time, then we, we couldn't start. We had delays with that study because the scanners were down. And then um, we knew your time is running up. And then uh, um, you had to learn new analysis, new stuff, a lot, a lot of new stuff. And I felt a bit sorry. So I at least did a bit of a prolongation. But at the other hand, um, it showed again how you could handle uh, under um, yeah, stress, under, under time critical periods. And um, uh, so, so that also was for me uh, great to see how you matured uh, in these critical times. And I have to also say that at that phase, the last phase, uh, you did was now Peters, your supervisor, second supervisor, was extremely important uh, to stand by because uh, I tried to help, but if, you know I have not so much time. And then you did really, really um, was your daily supervisor and managed uh, very well with you together to complete that 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 work. But of course, there's not only work; there are also hobbies. And I, I, I was actually I heard a little bit before, but also asked a bit around, and that was great to learn that you seem to have a good work-life balance. I was quite impressed what I learned about you. And um, I didn't know that you do quite so, uh, heavy sports. Uh, that was new to me, um, um, such as things like power pumps. And I'm not even know what that is, honestly. Um, but, but you also enjoy life. You enjoy in the sense of not only sports life, but also food like I enjoy or drinks. And I heard that you are value, especially a good class of gin which I can understand. That's very good. Um, um, but I also heard that your colleagues admire your willpower. When, when some of those get daily uh, addicted um, from Bandito's cookies, you said no and, and switched to your healthy food, like the mix of nuts and things like that. So this is also, I'm not sure whether you did neurofeedback training for that, but it's quite great achievement, I have to say. Yeah. And um, the most uh, thing which, which put me, my socks off was, that I learned um, uh, just a couple of days ago that you are also a rock star. You know, I, I got a link to YouTube where I saw you uh, um, performing and it was amazing, I have to say, you know, so, so you, you did this um, show me how to live and, and your performance is just amazing, you know, really fantastic. I didn't know anything about that. And you can imagine uh, how much I see my horizon about you is expanding even up till today. So that's really great. And continue that. This is really cool. I love this kind of music. Fantastic stuff. You know. Um, of course, we should also not forget the most important private event in your life. Um, 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 you, you, had, you married uh, Manuel in August last year. And I remember very well that you uh, demanded some hectic, um, in my feeling at the time, hectic uh, online meetings to quickly sort out the issues emerging by that. And I thought, what issues? And you, you were fully right, because lots of letters had been already sent to Central for your PhD with Tursic in, at the last time. So, so, so I contacted uh, Renze Huxter and others to, to settle that. And it was at the end all easy. But, but you were fully right. We had to had a look at this. And um, I should also say that when I asked you um, uh, why did you uh, uh, choose to have the, the last name was mine, you said, you know, most importantly, it, the Tursic had so many accents from the Slovenian uh, uh, writing that you were quite happy that you don't have this because it has led to some confusions. I, I thought it was very funny that, that it was a good, good explanation why you did that. But we should not forget that before Manuel came into your life, there were already two heartbreakers, right? And I'm talking now about your two guinea pigs, you know? <laughs> And I heard uh, from Judith Eck this time uh, that uh, um, you uh, basically loved them so much that you even bought them clothes. There were apparently pictures going around, if rumor has it correctly, with Christmas clothes dressed guinea pigs. I haven't seen them. I, I want them. to see them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then um, uh, just to come to the end, um, I, I was very happy uh, to hear uh, already last year that you found uh, this new position at Philips uh, as a healthcare and market scientist, and that you find, find now this job also challenging and satisfying, as you told me, and that's very good. And I'm really glad uh, to hear about this. Um, and um, um, I, I also loved that you told me once in an online meeting, Rainer, by the way, they found it very good when I applied that I worked in a company helping to uh, certify a medical product. And so I thought, Phew. so all this work you did for that was at the end, maybe also helpful for getting this job. So at least this, this I was uh, happy to hear. And um, yeah, before closing, I want to give now Judith Peters the word, your second supervisor to address you personally, Judith. 
Thanks, Rainer. So also congratulations from me, Dr. Rasmine. You did it. <laughs> uh, keep it short so you and your loved ones can celebrate this achievement as soon as possible. Because, well, I actually already, yeah, I concur with all the, what uh, Rainer and the others already have said today. So you did a great job and I couldn't be more proud of you. And I thoroughly enjoyed our collaboration. So also thank you for that. I, I already miss our chats. So even during our complex ultra high field fMRI neurofeedback measurements, we were still laughing and chatting away about a billion different topics. And that shows your impressive multitasking and conversational talents. And I'm sure they appreciate these skills also in your new job. So I want to wish you all the best at Philips and they're happy to have you. Thank you so much, to both of you. Yeah, I just want to conclude um, that you know you are such a wonderful person. Just stay as you are, and then the world is a more happy place. And I would also say that um, me, but also the colleagues I talk to, all uh, miss you se se severely already now. Your talents, your humor, and your helpful, caring personality. And um, we are all we are so grateful to have this time with you together. And we wish you, um, uh, yeah, all the best for the future for private life and your your professional life. Thanks so much. Yeah, we can all give a clap now. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. Because it's always a bit strange uh, being fully online, but uh, it should not be less, uh, Anita. Don't forget that. Dr. Rasmine, also on behalf of the Board of Deans and of the our rector, and also our Dean Harald Merkelbach, congratulations uh, to this achievement. Um, also to the supervisors, I have to say, and uh, many thanks again to the people of the Corona and the Reading Committee for taking part in this. Congratulations to the family and the friends. And I hereby now officially close this academic session. And there is some time 